The Samsung Galaxy S23 Ultra has been out for roughly a month now, and it's widely regarded as one of the best Android smartphones out on the market. I've been using this device as my daily driver, and full disclosure, Samsung did not send me this device. I bought it with my own money, and I'm trying to keep these videos as unbiased as possible. As a photographer, I love taking pictures, so I've been shooting a ton with the S23 Ultra, trying out all of the different settings and seeing how they affect image quality. So in this video, I'm going to be focusing on the camera settings and show you guys my optimum setup so that you can have a great shooting experience as well. There are tons of different camera settings from basic to advanced, as well as hidden settings and features as well. So I apologize in advance if this video is going to get a bit too long or overly technical, but I did a ton of testing, so hopefully the results are worth it. And besides, for a phone as expensive as this, don't you want to get the most out of it? And if you've seen some of my previous videos, I am still working on my full photographer's review of this phone. I just wanted to make this video first so that I can get it out there. And for those of you who also have the S23 Ultra, you can follow along and apply these settings to your device. So if you find this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up and maybe even share it with a friend who has an S23 or is considering buying one. So here I have my camera settings pulled up. And I've already reset them, so this is what it should look like right out of the box. At the top, we have Scene Optimizer. And for this one, I usually like to leave it off because I don't want the phone to be adjusting the settings and I want as much control over the final output as possible. However, do note that if you keep it off, you won't get some features like Auto Night Mode as well as Document Scanning. So depending on your use case, you might want to toggle it on and off as you shoot. Moving down the list, we have shot suggestions. And usually I just leave this off because it's supposed to help you line up the shot, but it doesn't really help that much. Scan QR codes, I always leave it on just because everything uses QR nowadays and it doesn't affect the image quality. Under pictures, you can swipe the shutter to take burst shots or to create a GIF. For this one, I like to keep it on burst shot because if there's action or if I wanna capture multiple frames, this is a really quick way to do it. Watermark, I'll just keep it off. Under advanced picture options, you can see pro mode picture format. I set this to raw and JPEG. This way, when you're shooting in pro mode, you get both the processed JPEG from the device as well as the raw file that you can tweak later on. Under selfies, this one doesn't really affect picture quality, so you can turn it on or off based on your own preference. Everything under the video tab, I just leave as standard, but you can adjust those to your liking. Tracking autofocus can be useful if you are trying to take pictures of subjects that are always on the move and the camera won't hunt focus nearly as much. However, if you have tracking autofocus on, when you tap on the screen, it will select your autofocus subject. You don't get the slider adjustment for the brightness. In order to bring that up, you would then need to hold down on the screen and that's how you can adjust your brightness. But if you enable this, then tracking is no longer active. Grid lines I always turn on because I find that it really helps with composition. Location tags is another one I like to turn on so that I can keep track of where I took the photos. And then under shooting method, I like to turn on floating shutter button because this will allow you to have a secondary shutter that you can place anywhere around the screen so you don't have to reach all the way down here to snap the photo. Under settings to keep, I like to turn on camera mode and selfie angle. This means that when you turn your screen off or when you relaunch the camera, it will return to your previous settings that you used for these modes. Now this concludes the basic camera settings. However, if you go to your Galaxy Store, you can search for the app called Camera Assistant. Now this is made by Samsung, so it's not a random third-party app. And if you download this, it will enable additional features for your camera. You can either launch the app like that, or if you go back to your camera settings and you scroll down, you can see it actually adds a sub-menu item called Camera Assistant. So within Camera Assistant, the first option you have is Auto HDR. 
Your phone will automatically do HDR no matter if it's on or off. But when it's on, it tends to do it a bit more aggressively so you get more dynamic range. However, sometimes I'll find that it can go a bit overboard, like the sky will be too blue or the shadows will be too lifted. So it's one of those settings where I will just toggle on and off depending on the scene that I'm trying to capture. Picture softening I just leave off because I find that I don't really notice any over sharpening so it looks natural enough as is. Auto lens switching is one of my favorite toggles and I always turn this off because I don't want the phone to be switching the lens for me. If I want to use the 3x telephoto this way it will always stay on that 3x. It won't be switching back to the main camera if there's not enough light for example. Quick tap shutter is one that everyone has been talking about. Basically what it does is it allows you to snap the picture as soon as your finger touches the shutter button instead of when your finger lifts off it. People say that if you enable this it basically eliminates shutter lag which is a huge problem of Samsung devices. Now to be clear this does help with the shutter lag but this does not solve the motion blur problem that most people are having with their phones. Motion blur is caused by slow shutter speeds and not necessarily shutter lag. So it's two separate problems here. Now I've tested this out extensively and under this category, you can see capture speed and you get three different options of quality, balance, and speed. So to dive a little deeper into the quick shutter option, in bright conditions, the biggest change in quality is between quality and balance. The difference between balance to speed is minor. But the biggest difference is seen in low light. You can see a huge decrease in sharpness, increase in noise, and a decrease in color rendering when you go from the quality setting to the balanced. There is definitely a ton of processing going on behind the scenes that affects the final image. So for the quick shutter, I like to leave it on the quality setting because it still does its job at reducing shutter lag. But in my testing, the most important thing to remember at reducing shutter lag is to clear your recent apps before shooting because it's all of those background processes that really bog down the camera. The next option I like to change is the timer multi-photo options. So I like to put this on three pictures with a one second delay in between shots. This way, if I'm shooting with the phone on a tripod and I'm taking a picture using the S Pen, it will take three different shots instead of just one. Now coming back into the camera interface, you can see up top, there is this three by four option. If you click on that, it expands the menu out. And this is where you have your 50 megapixel option as well as your 200 megapixel options. So obviously 200 megapixels is the highlight of this new camera system. And in terms of quality and resolution, it is absolutely fantastic. The colors look great, good sharpness throughout, and minimal noise. However, it does take a sec to capture and process the shot. And if there's any movement while it's capturing, even very slight movement, the image will come out looking blurry. However, the February update did speed up this process a lot, so hopefully it's something that Samsung can keep improving on in future updates. The last thing to consider about this mode is the file size, because images can get to be over 20 megabytes per image. And this takes up a lot of space on your hard drive, and it also takes a lot of processing power to edit those images. Now going back to the camera setting, the 50 megapixel mode seems to be the sweet spot between speed and quality. The best part about using the 50 megapixel mode is that it can work in both pro mode as well as expert raw. A hidden feature of both the 50 megapixel and 200 megapixel mode is that if you click on the 1x button, you can see that there are additional zoom levels that you can choose from. 2x, 4x, and 6x. While this is pretty cool, just keep in mind that this isn't actually using any other lens on your device. It's still using that main 200 megapixel sensor, but just digitally cropping in. This can help with framing different compositions, as well as adjusting exposure for the specific area in which you want to shoot. And as far as the standard 12 megapixel shots, I'm honestly not very impressed, at least with the test shots. Compared to the 50 and 200 megapixel shots, 
these 12 megapixel images tend to have more noise, washed out colors, and weird exposures. And in my everyday testing, I also found that the phone tends to overexpose most scenes. Of course, you can still tap on the screen and adjust that brightness slider manually, but for most people, they just want to take out their phone, point it at something, and take the shot, trusting the device to have the right settings. And at this point, it's really hit or miss. But of course, the 12 megapixel mode is still the one that you should be using for 90% of your shooting, and hopefully with updates, it can be further improved. Coming back to the main camera interface, when you get close to an object, you'll see these two yellow circles on the bottom left corner. This is your focus enhancer. If you turn it on, the camera will automatically switch to the wide angle camera to get macro shots. But if you turn it off, you can see that it switches back to the main camera and you can get nice shallow depth of field. So again, this is just preference based on the type of photo that you're trying to take. But for most of my shots, I like to leave it off. Under the More tab, you have the Pro Mode that has been on Samsung phones for a couple of generations now. Under this mode, you're able to manually control your camera and adjust all of your settings, like shutter speed, ISO, and even manual focus. Now this mode is really powerful because it's the closest that you can get to a professional camera. However, if you go back into that More tab, you can see that there's also another button here called Expert Raw. When this phone is new, you'll see that there's a little download icon right next to the Raw button. And if you click on this, it will prompt you to download this Expert Raw app. Now this is basically another camera app that allows you to take your raw files to the next level with computational raw. Once you open the Expert Raw app, you can see that the interface is slightly different compared to the standard camera app. After opening up settings, you can see that there is a bunch more settings that only apply to Expert Raw. Like I said in the beginning, there are so many different settings, and that's one of the reasons why it's taking so long to create these videos, because I am trying to test out each one to find the best image quality. The first option is High Efficiency Raw. And this one allows you to save space for your raw files, but it's just based on personal preference. The next one, I always like to keep it as is, which is save raw and JPEG. This way I get the finished file as well as the raw file to tweak later on. Under special photo options, you can see that there's a labs tag, which means that this is still highly experimental. This adds multiple exposure pictures as well as astrophotography options. Moving down, we also have Auto HDR, and like I said for the other one, you can leave this on or off depending on the type of scene that you're trying to capture. But Computational Raw already does a ton of HDR and processing to the shot, so oftentimes you may not need this turned on. Again, you also have the Tracking Autofocus option, as well as Grid Lines, Shooting Methods, and Shutter Sound. It's really confusing to me why Samsung has both Pro Mode as well as Expert Raw. I mean, compared to other phones that don't have manual controls at all, I guess this is still highly appreciated. But to have both is still definitely confusing. And in my testing, there's a huge difference between the raw files that come out of Pro Mode as well as Expert Raw Mode. Pro Mode produces raw files that are closer to traditional raws that you would expect from a professional camera. It's lower contrast, less saturated, and you can see the noise and other imperfections in the shot. Expert RAW, on the other hand, produces computational RAW, which means that there is a ton of processing done to the file. And with computational RAW, it takes a lot longer to capture as well due to that processing. The files are high contrast, more vibrant, sharper, and most of the noise has already been cleaned up. However, just to complicate things further, I find that these results aren't always consistent. Look at this low light example, where the expert raw shot looks almost black and white. For a low light file, it definitely is clean though, with minimal noise and everything looks sharp. But the colors are all stripped away and I don't know why it was processed like that. The promo shot, on the other hand, looks much more realistic and true to life. However, it's also much more noisy and darker overall. Now one last note about Expert Raw. The ISO on auto 
will boost higher than the 3200 max that it allows in the controls. This is weird because if it will automatically use 4000 ISO on a shot, why not just let me choose to shoot at 4000 ISO to begin with? It is called Expert Raw, right? So ultimately, it's really difficult to say which one is better, and I don't think there's a clear answer. No matter what, you're going to be getting a raw image, which is already so much better than JPEGs when it comes to post-processing. Alright, so I think that covers pretty much every setting. For most people, just shooting in auto with the defaults will do a great job 90% of the time. But I hope this video was still valuable to everyone, especially those who want to take mobile photography more seriously. It's great to understand what each feature does, even if you don't really use it all the time. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you want to support my channel, please subscribe. I'd really appreciate it. And once again, I am still working on my full photographer's review. So if you have any questions, drop them in the comments below, and I'll do more testing and try to answer them in that full video. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Peace.